Hello! My name is Libby, and I'm going to be teaching you a little bit about French horn over the next few weeks, so let's get started! Before we even bring our horn up to our face to play a note, it's really important that we're sitting with our best posture. And you've probably heard this a million times before, that's only because it's really important. So make sure your feet are flat on the ground, make sure we're sitting up nice and tall and that you're not slouching anyway. Okay? The second thing that we should pay attention to if we're horn players, and this will help us with our posture, you'll see in a second, is we want to make sure when our hand is in our bell, our hands should sort of look like we're about to give our handshake, but our thumb is just tucked on top, okay? So kind of like this, um, and when we put that in the bell, it'll look like this here. It's nice and comfortable. You never want to clamp over this opening because then our sound isn't going to be able to come out of our instrument, and it's going to make it a lot harder for us to play. So make sure to leave enough room in the bell, um, have a nice opening there with your hand, and when you bring your horn up to play, your hand can sort of help support you, okay? So if we have good posture, an important thing to remember is that whatever your posture is, nice and tall, you need to bring your horn to you, okay? So like this. A lot of people, if they play on the leg, which is fine, they'll put their bell on their leg, and then kind of go to it and slouch over. That's not what we want. You want to put your horn where it's supposed to be, on your embouchure, wherever that is going to give you the best sound, you know, right there on your embouchure, and then find a way to adjust your leg and make sure that that's helping you play at your best playing position possible. Okay? So remember, never go to your horn. Your instrument comes to you, okay? That's going to give you the best air support, the best sound that we can have, and that's what we want, right? All right, so before any practice session, it's important to make sure you warm up. I don't know if you've warmed up yet today, but I thought it would be important to share some sort of warm-up ideas. So the first thing is because we play a brass instrument, um, it's powered by our air. So it's really important that we do a little bit of breathing every day. And not just the breathing that's us sitting in class or at home kind of passively. You want to do some really aerobic breathing to get things moving in your lungs. So one thing I like to do even before I start to play is take a few really big breaths. So I'm going to demonstrate them for you now and you can feel free to join in. I'm just going to take three really supportive full breaths. Okay? Ready? And when I do that, I want to feel really relaxed. I want my lungs to fill up all the way, like they're balloons. And so I can be able to expel the air in the most relaxed way possible. You want it to be a really deep sound in your throat. You don't want to hear any type of because that's going to be something in your throat, like your vocal cords or throat tissue getting in the way of a good inhale. That's going to create discomfort for you. It makes that kind of unpleasant noise, but also it's not going to be the best breath you can have. So breathing is very important to us. Another important thing for brass players would be singing and buzzing. So sometimes to warm up at the beginning of the day, a lot of advice people would give you is to warm up slow and low, okay? And you want to warm up with the smallest little chunks of skills possible, so you make sure you're doing them properly. So if, if our instrument, if this horn is an amplifier, our mouthpiece is a microphone, and we want to make sure we're doing the best thing mechanically on the microphone before we go and add the whole instrument, okay? So we did our breathing, then it's important to practice our buzzing, and something that's tied really close to buzzing is singing. So I'm just going to play our middle C, um, the one right below the staff, okay, just to find the pitch. Good, and then now that I have that pitch in my head, I can sing it. Da. When you sing a note, you want to pay attention to how relaxed you feel and how easy it is to make that note sing out and be resonant because we want to mimic that when we buzz and ultimately when we play, okay? So, da. And then I take my mouthpiece, I'm going to buzz that pitch, keeping everything nice and open up here and relaxed for the best tone that I want. Good. And one 
once you feel good about your buzz, your buzz shouldn't, it shouldn't be crass, but it should sound very buzzy and vibrant, okay? You don't want it to sound tight, but you want it to sound very buzzy, obviously. Once you have a good, what you feel is a good buzz, you feel like your air was right behind it, you feel like you centered in on the pitch, that's when you want to play on your instrument, okay? So I'm just going to play a low C long tone because long tones are really important to us as brass players for air control, tone quality, embouchure building, and they're a great way to start warming up at the beginning of the day. So I'm just going to play a low C long tone. I'll hold it for eight counts. One, two, we're ready. play that one more time and this time you can play with me and try to just do all those things we just talked about about supporting with your best air and your best tone quality one two we're ready <sighs> And you can do a long tone on any note that you can play. Just make sure you are doing the right things to make that sound happen properly. You're staying relaxed. Um, try to keep them around that low C to begin with so you're not playing too high or too low because if you start them before, if you start those notes before you're properly warmed up, you might develop some bad habits and you might not be making them the right way. All right, so to get started with the scale we are working on today, we are going to be working on our concert B-flat major scale. Um, horn is a transposing instrument, so for us that is our F scale. Starts on F, ends on F. It's important that as horn players with our transposing instruments, once your band director says concert B-flat, you want to automatically think of our F scale. And it's confusing at first, but after a while you get the hang of it and it's like second nature, okay? So it starts on our F because it's our F scale, there's only one accidental, just the B flat, okay? So anytime you see a B and you're in the key of F, that's going to be a first valve B flat, okay? It's important to practice scales or anything in sort of smaller chunks at first so that you learn the right way and that you're starting slowly and you're kind of taking it in manageable little pieces. So Let's start with the first five notes of this scale, which they are going to be F, G, A, B flat, C. All right, if you have a double horn, you will press the thumb valve on A through the top of the scale. If you just are playing a single horn right now, you don't even worry, it's the same fingerings for now. And I'll, I'll talk about them once we get up to that D, okay? so. The first five notes, F, first valve, G, open, A, T1 and 2, B flat, T1, C, T open, or just open, okay? I'm going to play those notes for us right now, just articulating really slowly in quarter notes. You can listen this time through, and then the next time you can join in. One, two, ready. <laughs> Take a second to pause here if you need to practice, or I will play that one more time so that we can do it together. One, two, we're ready. Good. Now, to finish out to the top of the scale, we are going to play C, D, E. And you want to make sure, even though it can feel awkward to sing at first, singing will really help you make sure you stay relaxed up here. Because sometimes when we get into the higher notes of French horn range, people tend to squeeze and tense up. And that cuts off our air and doesn't give us as good a sound that we want up there in that higher register. You know, you want it to sound nice and singing and resonant. So if you cut off your air, you're not going to do very well in that department. Okay? Do, do. If you're on double horn, if you're on single horn, do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going 
going to play this one time through, uh, then you can pause and practice, or you can join in on the next repetition. Starting on C, going to the top of our F scale. Awesome. So now I'm going to play all the way through the ascending portion of the scale. Listen the first time, the second time you can join in. One, two, we're ready. <laughs> Let's do that one time together. One, two, ready. Excellent. And you can practice that a little bit now, pause the video, or we continue can continue downwards through the scale. So for Horn players who are just starting, and for people who have been playing a while, sometimes high notes can be a really tricky point for us. It can be really hard to even get up that scale, which is why things like singing or mouthpiece buzzing can really help you. Um, if I am trying to make sure I'm getting the right embouchure setting and the right airspeed to get all the way up to that high F, sometimes I will mouthpiece buzz it, and make sure the notes are coming out really vibrant, that I'm not tensing up anything, that my lips are even on the mouthpiece, you know, and that I'm not like pulling one back or forward, but that they're just like this. That can be important to do to make sure you're doing the right things to get a good sound. So I'm just gonna buzz that scale really quick. I'll slur it and buzz it all the way up to give you an example of one way to practice a scale if you're struggling a little bit with the range right now. So a slurred, Mouthpiece buzzed, F scale ascending. Good, and you heard, even with me, there was a little shake in my tone at the beginning. That's something you would go back for and try to get rid of to make sure your air is really working. So one more time, that buzzed F scale. You can join in on this rep and try to buzz your way up the F scale along with me. Good. And at the top, you want to pay attention to your airspeed and what your armature felt like to get through that scale. Okay. Another way to practice the scale, if you're having trouble with your range, is like we just did on the mouthpiece, slurring it. Because if you're slurring, you don't have to worry about your articulations getting in the way of your airstream. So a slurred ascending F scale would sound like this. And if I'm slurring, you just only want to think about your air and having an embouchure that can accommodate and make the best sound possible, okay? Think of your air first, don't think of your embouchure first. Think, is my air going forward? Is it supporting from my abs the way it needs to? Or am I trying to make this all happen with my embouchure? You want the answer to be that your air is really working for you and supporting first instead of squeezing tight with your lips, okay? Um, another way to work up your range to that high F is to do a siren on the mouthpiece, okay? You might have heard of these before. It's just going the whole octave using as fast air as you can to try to get that note to sing out so you, again, know what it feels like. Here's an example of a siren on the mouthpiece. <laughs> join in this time to play the siren with me. I'm just using faster and faster air to get to the top and then to come back down. I'm slowing down my playing. Awesome. And these translate to the horn really well because they sound, they are horn rips. With those sirens just now, we've 
gone the ascending portion of the scale, so now we want to bring down the scale and do the descending portion. So I think it's important here, if you're still working on your high range, to start with the first half of the scale and then add the second half so that you're not trying to just pin that high F, okay? So to start here, we're going to play an ascending and descending F scale nice and slowly so that we don't have to articulate that high F if we're not sure where that sits on the horn left, on the horn yet. One, two, we're ready. <laughs> Um, that I took a breath at the top, even though I wasn't necessarily out of air, is because when we get to the bottom part of our air where we start running out, that air can be a little bit unsteady and not really reliable for good support and sound for the French horn. So you'll notice if you ever take a really deep breath and exhale all the way, once you get to the end, that air starts getting shaky. When we get to about the one third of our air, that's when it's poor quality, and we don't really want to play with that type of air. We want to play with the type of air that gives us the best chance to have a really nice sound. That's why we take a breath at the top of the scale. So here's one more time, the F scale. One, two, we're ready. <laughs> Now, like we said before, we talked about a few ways that if you're struggling with that scale, that you can break it down and make it easier. You can slur it. You can use mouthpiece buzzing to help you find those notes at the top and the type of airspeed you need. You can do mouthpiece sirens. You can do rips to get up to the top and feel where that pitch is. But ultimately, make sure you practice your scales a little bit every day and that you're not tensing up as you ascend down them. And over time, you'll build the skills. You need to be able to play those scales really easily. The second scale that we will be working on today is the Concert G minor scale. The Concert G minor scale is the relative minor to the Concert B flat major scale, which just means that they share the same key signature. In that case, for B flat, the key signature is two flats, B flat and E flat. So the relative minor's key signature would be the same, a B flat and E flat, and it would start on G, okay? You'll remember that horn is a transposing instrument. When we hear B flat, we need to be thinking, that's our F. Likewise, when we hear concert G, we need to be thinking, that's our D. So this scale for us is going to start on D. It's going to have the same key signature as F, which is one flat. So our starting note will be D, and the only accidental we have to worry about is the B flat, just like in the key of F. Now, prior we talked about a few ways to break down scales so that you could practice them and kind of ingrain them in your muscle memory. So we're going to mix it up a little bit with practicing this scale, and instead of articulating each note like ta, 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 we're going to slur through. So to start, let's just take the ascending half of the scale, slurring. I'm just going to play a D so we can find our starting note. And I'm going to sing and show you the fingerings this first time through, okay? So concert G minor scale, our D minor scale, just B flat is the only accidental you have to worry about. And we're going... I'm going to sing it as if it were slurred, so I'm not going to say da, I'm just going to slur. Da. And you can join in and sing this time. Make sure you're staying nice and relaxed. Da. Great, now I'm going to go ahead and play that slurring all the way up. You can listen this round through and then the next time join in. 
One, two, ready. <laughs> Play it together. One, two, ready. Great. Now, luckily, um, D is a little bit of a less high note than F. So I think for this part of the scale, we can break it in half and just do the ascending half. Okay? So one thing that you want to do, if that does feel like a high note to you, is practice having your air be there right away so that you can hit the note right off the bat with good support and that you don't have to tense up because that's going to make a crack, okay? One thing you can do to start this note up here is, like we talked about, you could buzz it. Um, da, sing it. Be like, what does that feel like? when I'm playing that note, and how can I recreate that when I put it on my horn? Another thing you can do to meet that note right where it sits is to use something called an air attack, which is where you don't use your tongue at all. You just... And this trains you to know what air speed you need to hit that note. Here's an example of me doing an air attack. The beginning doesn't sound as clean and right away because it takes a second for your air. You'll notice you might have heard my air start before my lips started vibrating and the note started. That's because we don't have our tongue there to really define the beginning of the note. But the purpose of an air attack is to get your air started at that note and feel what it feels like to have that support there right from your abs right away. So that being said, let's take it down through the scale, just in quarter notes. Da okay, it'll just be, I'll do that one more time for fingers. These are double horn fingers. Da And if you're on a single horn, that top D will just be first valve and C will be open. And the rest will be the same as we learned in F. This is the descending half of our D minor scale. Two, you ready? with me this time through. One, two, ready. Good. Now we're going to put the scale together. Let's play all the way up and all the way down, slurring. I will take a breath after that top D and then re-articulate the C and continue to slur the rest of the way down. I'm still going to be in quarter notes this time through. One, two, you're ready. Good. And when you're, if the scale is new to you, you might want to just practice it that slow for the next couple days. Get it under your fingers, learning it right with a really full sound. Then. You can play it as written with a slower tempo, but you'll have the faster subdivisions. So if we were to play this as written on your page, makes sense? So I'm going to play that right now, articulated with the quarter and eighth note pattern all the way up and down our D minor scale.
you can join in this round. Here's the tempo. One, two, ready. <laughs> We talked about some different articulations you can use, like slurred versus tongued. Um, you can also play the scale with different articulations, like legato versus staccato. So I'm going to play it through once legato, so you can hear what that sounds like. And this, if you practice it, will help you play in different styles and get used to doing that. One, two, we're ready. <laughs> Legato, I'm really trying to connect the notes. Let's do it once more together, playing with legato notes, long connected lengths. One, two, ready. <laughs> Foil to that would be the staccato style, so nice and lifted and separated. Here's the first round through of that, so you can hear what it would sound like to play the staccato. One, two, ready. <laughs> important to practice scales a little bit every day or every time you practice because they're really the foundation of music. A lot of times you'll see scale patterns or things that you can relate back to scales in music that you see in real life. So it's important to make sure you're practicing them ahead of time so that you have them down when the time comes to really need them. Scales can get kind of boring, admittedly, um, which is why there's so many resources that you can use to practice them. I just listed a lot there. There's also scale patterns you can play that you could find in a method book, things like that, that kind of orient you to the scale, but keep it from getting too dry or boring. So make sure you keep practicing your scales, and next week we'll have two different scales to work on. To wrap up our mini masterclass for today, I'm going to share five practice tips that I wish I had known when I was in high school. We shared a few tips throughout this video and methods and tricks to practice things or break them down. Uh, these five tips are more general. You can apply them to anything you're practicing, any piece of music, not just scales. And they're overarching, but very helpful, I've found. The first tip is to practice slowly and to break things down and to not be afraid of breaking things down. It can be overwhelming to try to play through a piece of music and maybe you're not getting much of it right, but if you break it down into smaller manageable chunks, you'll be able to get one thing right and once you get that right, you can move on to the next thing and practice that way so that you're building a lot of successful chunks that you can then string together, sort of like how we did with the first scale. Um, another benefit to practicing slowly is that you form the correct habits to play something instead of just trying to play really fast and you make mistakes and if you get it right it's only by chance when you go slowly you really program the habits to play something right and the muscle memory to be able to do it over and over and to do it the right way many times in a row you should always strive to do something right slowly um, as opposed to something fast that's mostly right by chance. Because if you practice something wrong, you form a bad habit and it's much harder to undo a bad habit than to start a new one. The second practice tip I would offer is to always refer back to basics that we talked about in the beginning of the video. Um, so always make sure you're sitting up straight, make sure you're using really good air support, make sure you're playing relaxed and trying to eliminate tension. The reason for this is sometimes if we're playing something really tricky, it cannot be working and we can be getting really frustrated and sometimes we forget about fundamentals that will be helping us. One example of this is if you're trying to play really high and you're tensed up and just trying to play a high note 
and you forget that if you tense up, your air can't get through your horn the right way. And so you're really creating a frustrating situation for yourself and it's not going to get better because you're forming a bad habit. So always refer back to basics if something isn't working. Am I sitting up straight? Am I taking full breaths? Even things like, is this the right fingering for this note? Make sure, chances are there's a pretty uh, mundane solution to the problem you're having. There's not like a secret, it's more like you need to be doing something more the right way. The third piece of advice I would give to myself in high school or any high schooler practicing is to be very patient with yourself and approach practice with the right mindset, which is a positive mindset. Um, there will be frustrating situations in your practice, but you want to meet those with an attitude that you can do this and you're going to be able to do this. You just need to put in the right work to get there. You never want to think, I can't do this and let that frustrate you because you'll end up proving yourself right. Um, and it's important to be patient with yourself during all this because you could be practicing the right way. Something just might be too advanced for you at this point, but you're only going to get better by hanging in there and continuing to practice the right way. So keep at it. The fourth piece of advice I would offer is to make sure you're looking for new and different material to play other than maybe just what you get for ensembles. Um, and also look for new and different material to listen to. You don't want to always stay inside your box and just practice your band music or your orchestra music or just what you're good at because that's not going to make you a stronger player. There's plenty of resources online where you can find different horn music to practice or you can find different master classes to watch and there's certainly plenty of places where you can find new pieces to listen to. So always try to expose yourself to a little bit more so that that way you are expanding sort of, sort of your breadth of knowledge and you're pushing yourself to grow as a player. The last piece of advice I would offer is to play in front of other people and to record yourself often. Now, these two things go hand in hand and they can both be pretty scary, but ultimately they're both really important if you wanna grow as a musician. So when you play in front of other people, you practice what it's like to perform for an audience and what it's like to feel nervous. So that when you know your solo in a concert comes or audition day comes, you're more familiar with your nerves and you have more practice playing through them with your best sound. Uh, playing in front of people, even if you're friends, can make you really nervous, but it's great practice for learning how to manage that. Similarly to recording, if you play in front of your friends and their musicians, they can give you feedback about things they liked and you should keep, things they think you could do a little bit differently or change, and anything of that nature, which is very helpful because our perspective, we're hearing this here, but they'll be hearing you a little bit farther away and they'll be able to hear what you sound like you know not attached to the instrument. Now recording is similar because ultimately it's going to help you hear yourself and give yourself feedback which is important. Recording can put a little bit of pressure on you just having the camera there but you want to listen back to your recordings and really think about how you sound which can be hard at first because maybe you don't like how you sound or you think you sound different than what you thought but if you listen to your recordings more over time you'll be able to pick out things that you can improve upon and be sort of like your own teacher which is helpful to help you make progress over a shorter period of time and like i mentioned before make sure you approach your recordings with a positive attitude don't beat yourself down just try to be objective and listen to how you sound and brainstorm ways that you can improve your playing on your own. So thank you for coming to our mini masterclass for today and I will see you next week.